Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, you know, about nicer software and data analysis um, and delve a bit into backgrounds. Um, so these are the familiar faces I showed yesterday. Uh, a lot of the slides here come from Craig. Uh, so big thanks to him for putting all of this together and a lot of work he's done on doing the uh, background models for nicer. Um, so an overview, talk very briefly about accessing the data and the nicer software. Um, and then doing spectral extraction and how to deal with backgrounds in different ways. Um, and then light curve extraction uh, and then some things to look out for in your data products. Uh, so I guess most of you already have PSOF installed and you've selected the nicer option, but in case you've not, this is where you go to get the data. Um, there's one important thing you should know when you're analyzing nicer data now is that the background models uh, use this geomagnetic data, um, which is basically space weather. Um, so you need to export this geomagnetic path um, or else you'll get an error when you're reducing the data. Um, but we'll come back to that later when we're actually looking at data. Um, so the NICER workflow is pretty straightforward. Um, it starts out with your data. You run NICER L2, um, which basically does some cleaning and calibration, and then um, NICER L3. Um, but we'll start with the, how you access nicer data. Uh, so Sunil covered most of this, uh, but just as a brief reminder, you have the HESARC data archive. Um, you can select the nicer box here, um, and put in whatever your favorite target is. Here I put in MaxiJ1820, which is a bright black hole binary that went out first a few years ago. Um, and then we'll pull up all of the observations for your particular target. Um, so here you see a lot of information like the RA and DEC, the time of the observation, the exposure time of the observation, um, and how offset is, the last column shows how offset the pointing was from the target that you wanted to observe. So sometimes there'll be two targets that are close to each other and you wanna make sure you grab the one that is actually observing your target. Um, if you click on this D, which is red here, it'll take you to this page um, where you basically select your data products and then you can tar the selected products and directly download them, or you can also get a script, uh, which is similar to WGET, which uh, Sunil showed yesterday as well. Um, so just in case you were curious, the, all of the nicer data come with OBS IDs, um, and they're broken down like this. So first four numbers are the proposal number, then you have the proposed target number. Um, so if somebody asked for multiple targets, it would be coded in this number. Um, the proposed visit number, um, so if you're observing a target over multiple epochs, um, and then the seg segment number, which is if the observation split over multiple days, um, is, this will track that. Okay, so once you have your data, you want to run the nice route through pipeline. It consists of multiple nicer tasks, which I'll briefly outline, but for the most part, you don't really need to worry too much about these. Um, so first, it applies calibration using nice cal. Um, and then it provides the MPF files um, using the calibrated data. Then it makes good time intervals by looking for times of like high particle background or SAA passage. Um, and it cleans and combines the data and then automatically screens for problematic FPMs, uh, which I'll come, come back, back to in a couple, couple of slides. slides. Um, so, so NICER L2 is pretty easy. Um, basically, just type it with your authentic name and it'll do all this for you. Um, so there's also a bunch of online documentation, online documentation and, uh, analysis uh, threads that if you have any questions, you can solve. Um, one, one important thing is to keep your calibration, calibration database up to date. Um, it changes probably, probably every six or so months, months for nicer. Um, and, and yeah, just a reminder of the systematic errors on the data, data are typically one to two percent um, in the point four to ten KB range. And, and this, this is just what the analysis, analysis threads page, page looks like, like and where you can access all of the different um, analysis threads, which tell you how to do various types of analysis. Okay, so what exactly does NICER L2 do more specifically? Um, it basically applies the standard calibration, so energy scale, timing offsets, things like that. Um, it does screening for pointing um, optical light. So NICER sometimes points near the sun, um, which causes some issues, um, and it screens for that. Um, it looks for high background and noisy detectors. Um, and you should always reprocess your data with nicer L2 as soon as you download it. So the, from the archive, they do process the data, but oftentimes they're running an older version of PSOF, maybe not the latest calibration files. Um, so by doing this, you're making sure you're up to date on everything. 
And yeah, here at the bottom is just an example of how you would run this task. Like I said, it's very simple. Um, really, the only input is the directory of your ops ID that you're working on. Uh, so Nicer, as we saw yesterday, has 52 detectors, um, four of which were turned off before launch. Um, you can see those in the bottom right here, which ones are turned off. Um, but occasionally, certain detectors, for various reasons, will auto-disable themselves, or some may have higher count rates than others for one reason or another. Um, and the pipeline actually screens for this, and will remove those detectors, the data from those detectors from your data set. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, you can check these number of detectors in the MKF file, um, but that's not really important for starting a nicer data. Um, so now I'm going to explain something that's a little complicated, uh, but it's kind of important for understanding some of the screening criteria for NICER. Um, those are what we call overshoots and undershoots. Um, so basically, the way NICER works, uh, as we saw yesterday, is you get an X-ray photon, creates electrons that then go into the anodes, and they actually end up in a capacitor. So the charge in the capacitor starts to build up to some point, and then once it hits this threshold point, it resets itself. Um, so there's just kind of noise in the detectors from various imperfections in the manufacturing process, which causes this leakage current. So over time, even if you're not getting any X-ray photons, you'll slowly build up charge in that capacitor. Um, so that's just shown here on the left. On the right is what you would see if you actually get an X-ray photon. So basically you see these jumps, um, which allow you to determine the energies that the X-rays deposited into the detector. Um, then it'll eventually still go up to some threshold and reset itself. But there are other things that can cause these resets. And for the undershoots, the main issue for these are the optical photons. So sometimes NICER points at a target that happens to be somewhat close to the sun, and you basically just get blasted by a bunch of light from the sun. So you get a ton of these optical photons hitting the detector, which causes a lot of charge buildup, and you get these very rapid undershoots. So basically, it keeps charging the detector, discharging, charging, discharging. Um, I mean, when that happens, happens basically, basically, NICER will filter out that data if it becomes too if you're getting too many uh, undershoots per second. Uh, so sometimes you'll look at an observation. It might even be of a very, very bright target, and you'll have very little data in the actual observation. And one reason this can happen is due to these undershoots. Um, so standard, standard screening requires less than 200 counts per second in the undershoots. Um, so anything above that, it'll basically remove automatically. You can reset this range by using this under only range. Um, wouldn't suggest using this unless you know what you're doing, but just so you know, it is an option. Um, but as you can see here, the high optical loading is not accounted for in the calibration and it can cause low energy noise. Um, so it's best to just try to avoid this if possible. Uh, the other end of the spectrum are the overshoots. Um, and that happens essentially when a charged particle goes through the detector and deposits a large amount of X-rays. Um, so these cosmic rays deposit so much energy that basically causes a reset, um, similar to the undershoots, but this is just usually one uh, event. And uh, some of these particles, they don't have to necessarily go through the entire detector, like shown here. They can clip to the edges of the detector, and this is actually a large part of what's responsible for the background in laser. Uh, so similar to the undershoots, the overshoots have some detection threshold, um, which if you're resetting the detector too frequently, will throw out that data. Um, and there are certain <laughs> places in NICER's orbit where this is more of a problem, for instance, near SAA or what we call the polar horn yeah. regions, which are some regions that contain charged particles. Um, and this, again, has another uh, parameter you can set, which is this only over range, uh, which is under this plot to the right, um, where you can set that to reset what overshoot count rate you want um, to allow through. Okay. So that's basically the process of NICER L2. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to run. Um, there's a couple things to look out for, but uh, generally for bright targets that are not near solar pointing angles, it's not too much of an issue. So now we move on to actually extracting your spectrum. Yeah, sure. Sorry to interrupt. No. In the schematics where you show where the photons are being detected, like that, yeah. um, is it always the case that the X-ray photon is is being detected closer to the anode, or uh, no, no, not necessarily. It could be yeah. anywhere along that yeah, yeah, yeah. direction. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So, nice L two and L three. Uh, basically, you run like this command at the bottom, um, and now there are two options for backgrounds. So, up until a few months ago, 
these backgrounds were separate and you had to run whole different scripts, uh, but now it's all bundled into the nicer L3 script. So it produces all the appropriate background files. Uh, so there's two options, which I'll delve more into in a minute. Um, one is 3C50, which is a template model. And another is a true background model uh, called Scorpion, that Craig has developed. Um, so this is all automated by nice rail three and it produces a script that loads in the files. Um, so basically all you have to do is go expect that in the load script and it just brings everything up for you. Um, and the spectra are automatically binned, uh, using the cache and bleaker paper, uh, that was discussed by Mateo earlier this morning. Um, so you also don't have to worry about that. Um, so as output, these are the files you'll get. So you get an extracted spectrum, uh, of your source a background spectrum file or script. So the spectrum file will actually be subtracted and that's in the case of 3C50, uh, but for Scorpion, it will be an actual model. Uh, you'll get the ARF and the sky ARF. Uh, so one is for the source and the sky one is for your actual sky background, uh, which we'll also come to in a few minutes. Uh, and then you get your response matrix, your background response matrix and the load file, which brings this all in XPEC for you. Um, so, as I mentioned yesterday, for paint sources, uh, background is extremely important. Um, and since NICER is a non pointed instrument, it's something we really have to care about and take care of. Uh, otherwise, we'll get bad results for our fits. Um, so, I'm going to spend a bit of time now explaining some of the physical components in the background models um, and then how we're dealing with them with NICER. So, one of the big ones is the cosmic X ray background. Um, so, essentially, just any given region of the sky, you have a large number of AGN, uh, which all are emitting X-rays, and NICER cannot resolve those. So for something like XMM, you can just split that part uh, when you pick your background. But for NICER, we can't do that. Um, so this is one piece of the model that we have to consider. So how many AGN are in this field and what they may or may not look like. Another one is the galactic X-ray halo. Um, so there's just a bunch of diffused gas in the galaxy um, that gets ionized. And when it recombines and emits emission lines uh, that are in the X-rays, um, and this varies across different sky positions, uh, but thankfully there are some maps uh, made by HaloSat, which improves that um, to help us get some constraints on what this looks like. Um, but it's still not perfect um, because the true distribution of the gas can be clumpier uh, than described by our model. Uh, there's also the local hot bubble, which Mateo also mentioned, uh, which is essentially just where uh, the sun and solar system sits, uh, has some diffuse plasma around it um, that causes X-ray background. Um, and this is mapped out by ROSAT pretty well. Um, so that's what we use basically for our models. Uh, there are also background components from solar wind exchange. So essentially this is when ions from the sun interact with particles in the upper atmosphere. And since uh, NICER is in low Earth orbit, when these particles become charged or ionized, they can recombine uh, with other electrons and emit X-rays. Um, so there's a number of different lines listed here uh, that you can watch out for. Uh, and over time, it seems that this oxygen K alpha line um, at 533 kV has become more and more prominent. So if you're working with newer NICER data, this is the one you should really worry about. Um, and I just have an example spectrum down here shown. Um, so don't worry about all the model components, but it basically is a source and a background spectrum uh, that you see this right bump here um, and this is that 533 UEK alpha emission. Um, and there's some parameters in the model that help you get rid of that piece, although there's still some excess uh, at a little bit higher. <laughs> so these are various uh, components you need to worry about, and there's still a few more. Um, so the Earth's magnetosphere can also trap high energy electrons and particles. Um, and when NICER passes through certain places and its orbit around Earth, it can interact with these particles, which causes um, high background. Um, so this is kind of a map of what uh, the different background components are as NICER orbits the Earth and where you have to worry about different things. Um, so there's various types of electrons. I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, you can look on the uh, analysis pages if you want more details on those. Um, but they happen at these uh, high latitude regions, lower latitude regions. Um, and then you also have the cosmic rays um, and the SAA passage. So NICER deals with these um, backgrounds in two ways, as I previously mentioned, actually three, but two for the spectral side of things. 
Um, and one is using a library model, which is called 3C50, and the other is actually modeling the background and fitting it uh, using Scorpion. So I'm going to start um, by discussing Scorpion a little bit, uh, then we'll move to 3C50. Uh, so Scorpion's whole goal was basically to map out all of these different background components, create a model that accounts for everything appropriately, um, and then use the, that model to fit the background rather than trying to subtract it in some way. Um, so we built basically a kind of simplish spectral model to try to account for all of this, and it's nicknamed Scorpion, um, and that stands for these components. So the S is for the SAA passage, uh, core is for all the cosmic rays, and then you have these precipitating and trapped electrons, uh, which are just high energy electrons, uh, but there's also a low energy electron component. Um, then you have the constant, astro, uh, constant component, which is basically your astrophysical X-ray background. Um, and then you also have a noise peak, which is currently not dealt with in the Scorpion. Um, so just to give you an idea how complex this can be, these are the various components that I just explained with Scorpion. So you have this constant component on the far left, upper left, uh, then you have SAA passages, and then you have the cosmic rays, um, and the SAA and the cosmic rays are mostly dominated, mostly proton particles. Um, and then you have, um, then you the, have electron the electron dominated, dominated which are the, the traps, traps precipitating low energy electrons. electrons. Um, so those, those different components are shown there. So we capture that in this model. Um, so this command at the very top, this load um, scope.xcm is basically how you load in everything. And that will load all of your response files, your spectrum, as well as create this background model um, that I'm gonna show here on the right. So this background model has two major sections. The top section is basically the uh, X-ray background, or sorry, the non-X-ray background. So these take care of the components that I previously just showed. So the trapped electrons and uh, the SAA and the cosmic rays. And based on the observing conditions at any given time, different components are set to different values. So there's some correlation, for instance, between the cosmic rays and what that will look like in the, the background. So we have an idea from the overshoots, how many cosmic rays are hitting the detector. We can then convert that into what uh, we expect the background to look like for that. So we preset these values for you. Uh, so Mateo mentioned when you're fitting models, having values close to the correct values to start is very important. Um, so then things that we don't expect to be uh, very predominant or frozen um, for the model so that you don't have to worry about it. Uh, however, for some of the lines that I showed you, like that oxygen line, uh, that will typically be frozen. That's something you kind of have to look for in your data. Uh, and if you do see an excess there, you can unfreeze it and basically fit it. Uh, and then the bottom component here shows all of the sky x-ray background. Um, and for the most part, everything except for these two components, uh, which is the halo emission, uh, will be frozen. And from my experience in working a lot with the, the sky x-ray backgrounds, these don't vary too often um, much from their starting values. So often you can just freeze those two components and kind of not worry about the sky background. It also has a pretty minimal effect uh, on the X-ray spectrum if you're working with brightish sources. Uh, and one really good thing about modeling the backgrounds here uh, that you don't get when you subtract is that you get a lot of covariance between the background uncertainties and your actual model uncertainties. So if you just subtract the background and you try to ask what the error on your power law is maybe, uh, it will be small, but it's kind of unrealistic because you haven't accounted for the variance in the background that could exist. So this is kind of the most conservative way um, to estimate your parameters and parameter uncertainties. Um, and one other important thing is that when you're fitting the Scorpion model, you have to open up all energy channels because it uses the data at the lowest and highest energies, even where NICER has very little effective area. And it accounts for the um, different like cosmic ray hits and things like that through those uh, extra channels. And again, when you're fitting, uh, you want to use PGSAT or CSAT because even at the highest energies and for bright sources, you still typically don't have enough counts uh, for it to be in the Gaussian regime. OK, so that was Scorpion. The other version uh, for the background, which is simpler to use, um, is 3C50. And basically what they do here is they build a library of models. So nicer because it's uh, non-imaging, Basically, the way they get backgrounds is they point to some space in the uh, sky where they know there's no bright x-ray source. And basically, you can do that for a long period of time. 
and you will get a background spectrum. You can fit that spectrum with different components, or you can just store that spectrum as kind of a model or library or sorry, template. Um, so there's different cuts they use here based on um, different parameters. So there are these IBG events, which basically are events that are happening in the 15 to 18 keV range where NICER has virtually zero effective area. So when things are hitting there, uh, you basically know that those are cosmic rays and not real X-ray photons. So we can throw those events out. Um, and then there's also the HREDGE, which is uh, events near the particle detector edge. So in these plots you see on the right, um, essentially everything above this dashed red line uh, are the IGB events. And then you have this red blue or this blue line and everything to the right of that are the HREDGE events. So these are the cuts that are essentially made. And then this kind of stripe that you see on the left, um, left of the red line are your source counts. So basically what you can do then is you can take background spectra uh, or blank sky spectra of a bunch of area uh, under a bunch of different observing conditions, measure these HREDGE and IBG values and construct templates from them for backgrounds. Then you can build a library out of it. So now basically anytime you have a new observation, you can compare to what the background sky files were, find the appropriate background for your observing conditions, um, and then use that to subtract off your data. So this is essentially the core of how 3C50 works. Um, and it's simpler because you don't have to model the background, you just subtract it, um, and you can just fit your source spectrum. Um, so the last one here, uh, this is an overview of all the models and what they offer. Um, and there's another model that's a bit older and a little outdated, but uh, it uses the space weather. So it's essentially looking at um, space weather data from you know, solar flares, what's going on in the upper magnetosphere, things like that. Um, and that currently is used for light curves, uh, but not used in spectra. OK, so the light curves for NICER are produced using the um, NICER L3 pipeline. Um, basically, you use the PAI range to set what energy range you want. And in uh, NICER, we have each energy channel is one, or sorry, it's 10 EV. Um, so below here, we have 300 to 1500, which is a 3 to 15 KV um, uh, light curve. Um, default is basically it runs with no background. Um, but if you want, you can use the space weather background, which basically uses the anticipated counts per second from the space weather uh, to subtract from your source light curve. Um, these different options are shown here at the bottom. Um, so one has this background model type SW, which stands for space weather. The other doesn't include that. Um, then you can also set your time binning with the time bin um, parameter. OK, uh, so just some uh, updates on the reminder on the calibration status. Uh, so typically, the systematic errors should be between 1% and 2%. Um, sometimes you'll see these wiggles at the bottom, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and overall, our agreement with NewStar uh, is pretty good. And as a reminder, the, the residuals are often deficiencies in the models um, and not necessarily the response. Um, so there's a couple things to watch out for in your um, NICER data analysis. So as I mentioned, these features. Um, so there are some, like we talked about earlier, that are actually due to the detector. Um, so, for instance, you have the gold M edge um, and then various silicon aluminum edges. Um, there's this noise peak that can happen, and that's due to optical loading. So if you're in a high optical loading zone, you can find an excess, uh, which is shown by this arrow in the far left, uh, below 0 0.4, 0 0.3 kV. Um, and at high optical loading, the, the response is broadened, uh, but this isn't modeled correctly in the RMF. Um, so if you have high optical loading, you need to be very careful. Uh, then you can also find these other types of wiggles, um, and these are often due to the uh, incorrect assumptions in the modeling, essentially. Uh, so the interstellar medium is often modeled with uh, TBABs or WBABs, um, but these models generate approximations, and they assume some abundances of the different elements, um, which are based on often what's found near or in our solar system, essentially. And that doesn't have to be the case at other places in the galaxy. Um, so you can basically find, yep. Oh yeah, sorry, that's back here. So optical loading is this noise peak you'll see on the far left. 
So typically you'll see this rise up um, and it's usually below like 0 0.4, 0 0.3 kV. Um, so there's different uh, edges you might see based on the different abundances of gas uh, along the line of flight to your source. Um, so you see the iron K edge at 0.56, or sorry, oxygen K edge, iron K edge at 0.71, and then neon. Um, so there are models that you can use like uh, TBFEO and TB Verabs, which allow you to vary these abundances or fit these abundances that you can try to help correct for this. Um, and then another issue that can happen that was alluded to a bit yesterday uh, are dust scattering halos. Um, so this is an example of one as seen by Chandra, um, which has very exquisite angular resolution, so you can see these very easily. Um, so this is from a black hole binary known as V404 sig. Um, essentially what happens is the source goes into a bright X-ray outburst, and the X-rays get reflected off of gas structures in the galaxy and redirected towards you. So you get these scattering halos. So since NICER is non-imaging, these are a problem, um, and you need to be very aware if your source has this or not. Um, because you need to try to model it out if it does, um, but that's also very difficult. So I would suggest just avoiding these in NICER if you can, um, but it's not always possible. Um, there can be issues with dead time and pileup, um, but pileup for uh, NICER is only sources greater than about two crab, um, which is not, you don't observe targets that very frequently. Okay. Um, so if you do have issues, there are ways to get help. Um, there's a bunch of online nicer documentation and the analysis threads, which are very helpful, helpful, and I showed you that um, slide a little bit earlier. Um, and then there's also a help desk uh, that you can actually send questions to, and it gets checked every couple days. Um, you usually, usually get a response in a few days, maybe up to a week, depending on how complicated your problem is. Um, but they're very responsive. Um, so yeah. That's all I have. Uh, I'll leave you with this nice image of uh, the constraints that NICE are placed on this particular pulsar's hotspots. Um, on the left here, you see a model of what we think the hotspots look like. Um, there's two kind of competing models, one with two spots uh, and one with three spots uh, that have kind of odd shapes on the left one. Um, and then on the right is a, a model that explains the leftmost um, model for the pulsar uh, showing the magnetic field lines of what this pulsar may look like. You see it's very non-dipolar, which is often an assumption made in uh, pulsar physics. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, when you're describing the parametrized uh, graph model, mm -hmm. you mentioned scoping, and then you say um, after parametrizing, you can evaluate the model with either which is that or sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, PGSAT what's what's yeah, essentially, if you have a source that's Poissonian and a background that's a model or Gaussian, is for PGSAT. Um, uh, can you put a rule of thumb on uh, what magnitude in the optical will cause you to, to um, have this uh, loading for optical photons? Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, the sun is the biggest contributor usually, uh, so <laughs> well, negative whatever. Uh, but I do imagine there's still some if you point it like a eighth mag star or something. But I don't know off the top of my head uh, how bad that would be. So for most sources that have not amazingly bright uh, optical counterparts, even the max the eighteen twenty is only I think twelve. Yeah, it should. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, um, you just described these processes using NICER tools. Are there uh, efforts on the way to provide Python programming interface for doing this analysis? Python program? Sorry. Like um, provide a Python script for doing uh, this fact task, like NICER 
Uh, yeah, I, so you can run, you could script it, but there's no like, you can't like call in nicer L3 into Python, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? You could write like a Python script around nicer yeah, L3 and run something. it from bash. Like, yeah. Not, no, uh, put, like, yeah, correct. There is, uh, yeah, they're slowly migrating stuff over to Python, but I, I don't think Nicer has anything. Yeah. Uh, at what level of data products do you recommend we start analysis? Yeah, so I mean, in, in most cases. Yeah, I mean, basically, you just want to get the raw data from the data archive. Uh, run nicer l2 which will apply all the latest calibrations and everything uh, and then nicer l3 and you'll get your data product cell and those are what you want to start analyzing so you'll get your spectrum and your light curve depending on what what you want to do but...